How was lunch, then? Lunch was great. Mount Vesuvius. Mentally draw a triangle up from the two remaining peaks to reconstruct the original cone shape of the mountain before it literally blew its top. At about noon on August 24, 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius erupted. The three raised stones in the middle of the road were a kind of ancient crosswalk. Every day, Pompeians flooded the streets with gushing water to clean them out. These stepping stones let pedestrians cross without getting their sandals wet. The Forum Pompeii's commercial, religious, and political center, the Forum stands at the intersection of the city's two main streets. Picture Pompeii in its first century heyday, population 20,000. Pompeii's citizens, wearing togas and tunics, gathered here in the main square to shop, do business, and socialize. The piazza was surrounded by two-story buildings on all sides. The pedestals that lined the square once held statues, now safely displayed in the museum in Naples. Square stands the Temple of Jupiter, king of all the gods. It's marked by a half-dozen ruined columns atop a stair-step base. Basilica Pompey's Basilica was a first-century palace of justice. This ancient law court has the same floor plan later adopted by many Christian churches, which are also called basilicas. The big central hall, or nave, is flanked by rows of columns marking off narrower side aisles. Notice that the column stumps are all about the same height. These were not ruined by the volcano. Rather, they were left unfinished at this height when Vesuvius blew, fear earthquake. The half-built columns show off the technology of the day. Uniform bricks were stacked around a cylindrical core. Once finished, they would have been coated not with pure marble, but with stucco made of marble dust, designed to simulate marble columns. The glass cases hold casts of Pompeians eerily captured in their last moments. When Vesuvius erupted, 2,000 Pompeii citizens suffocated under the ash, their bodies buried in volcanic debris. The bodies decomposed, leaving hollow cavities. While excavating, modern archaeologists detected these hollow spaces underfoot. By gently filling the cavities with plaster, the archaeologists were able to create molds of the Pompeians who were caught in the disaster. You're looking at modern plaster mixed with ancient bones. The Baths of the Forum Pompeii had six public baths, each with a men's and a women's section. Stepping inside, you're in the men's zone. The leafy courtyard at the entrance was the gymnasium. After working out, clients could relax with a hot bath, the caldarium, warm bath, tepidarium, or cold plunge, frigidarium. After the courtyard, the first big plain room you enter served as the dressing room. 
Holes on the walls were for pegs to hang clothing. The this was the tepidarium. It's ringed by many statues of male figures used as supporting pillars. These divided the lockers. Clients would warm up here, perhaps stretching out on one of the bronze benches near the bronze heater for a massage. Look up at the ceiling. It's half crushed by the eruption and half intact. Notice the fine blue and white stucco work. Now head into the next room, the steam bath room, or caldarium. Roman soaked in the big tub, which was filled with hot water. Opposite the big tub is a fountain. It spilled water onto the hot floor, creating steam. Lettering on the fountain reminded those enjoying the room which politicians paid for it. You can actually read how much they paid. 5,250 sestertiae. Look up at the ceiling and notice the grooves. To keep condensation from dripping annoyingly on patrons, fluting or ribbing was added to carry water down the walls. A fast food joint. After a bath, it was only natural to want a little snack. So just across the street is a fast food joint marked by a series of rectangular marble counters. Most ancient Romans didn't cook for themselves in their tiny apartments, so to-go places like this were common. Places like Julius in the Box, Muck Caesars, and Burger Imp. The holes in the counters held pots filled with food. Each container was like a thermos, with a wooden lid to keep the soup hot, the wine cool, and the rodents out of Caesar's McNuggets. In the street, look at the wheel grooves in the pavement, worn down through centuries of chariot traffic. You'll also see more of those stepping stones pedestrians use to hopscotch across flooded streets. The House of the Tragic Poet This house has a typical Roman floor plan. The entry is flanked by two family-owned shops. Notice that each shop has one of those tracks for a collapsing accordion-style door. First, the atrium, with a skylight and a pool to catch the rain. Next came the den, where the shopkeeper struck deals with his customers. Then the garden, with various domestic rooms facing onto it, and a shrine to remember both the gods and family ancestors. Water was critical for this city of 20,000, and this arch was part of Pompeii's water delivery system. The House of the Fawn Before going inside, stand across the street. Marvel at the grand entry with its welcome reading, Have. That's Latin for hail or be well. Now go on in. You're standing in Pompeii's largest home. With 40 rooms and 27,000 square feet, it covers an entire city block. In the courtyard stands the delightful, if small, statue of the dancing fawn. The bronze statue is famous for its realistic movement and fine proportion, but this is only a copy. The original is in Naples Archaeological Museum, as are so many of Pompeii's statues, frescoes, and mosaics. Continue further into the house. The next floor mosaic, with an intricate diamond-like design, decorates the homeowner's office. Beyond that is the famous floor mosaic of the Battle of Alexander. Once again, the original of this is in the museum in Naples. Pompeii's best-preserved home, retaining many of its mosaics and frescoes. The brothel, or lupinare. You'll find the biggest crowds in Pompeii at a place that was also popular 2,000 years ago, the brothel. Back then, a prostitute was nicknamed Lupa, or she-wolf, alluding to the call they made when trying to attract business. Ow, ow, ow! Stepping inside, you'll see that the brothel was a simple place, with a few cell-like bedrooms and beds and pillows made of stone. Notice that the bed legs came with little disc-like barriers to keep critters from crawling up. The ancient graffiti on the walls includes tallies and exotic names of the women, indicating that prostitutes came from all corners of the Mediterranean. The graffiti also served as feedback from satisfied customers. The faded frescoes above the cells may have been a kind of menu for services offered. One woman is depicted wearing an early bra. Note that the women are idealized, always shown with white skin, which was considered beautiful and contrasted with the darker skin of their horny customers.
The price of the ticket for going in is 12 euro and 50 cents per person and 25 euro for two people and you can buy the ticket here on the white boat to get off. 25 is the price just for going in. Right. For come out, if you're enjoying, yeah. don't forget a good tip for myself. Sir. The sale here works just for people. 
venivo dal vento rapito e incominciavo a volare nel cielo infinito volare oh, cantare di blu felice di stare lassù e volavo volavo felice più in alto del sole ed ancora più su mentre il mondo pian piano spariva lontano laggiù una musica dolce suonava soltanto per me volare Cantare oh, 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 oh. Nel blu dipinto di blu Felice di stare lassù Ma tutti i sogni nell'alba svaniscono perché Quando tramonta la luna li porta con sé ma io continuo a sognare negli occhi tuoi belli che sono blu come un cielo tra punto di stelle volare o oh, cantare tuoi blu felice di stare qua giù e continuo a volare felice più in alto del sole ed ancora più su mentre il mondo pian piano scompare negli occhi tuoi blu la tua voce è una musica dolce che suona per me volare
cuando tú verás Dime cuando, cuando, cuando La no el giorno, el hora en tu Ya va, Emigrante Lucha Una solución es simple Thank you. 